Thanks very much, Stephen. And um, it's just a pleasure to be able to introduce part two of the webinar that was presented on Tuesday, June, just this past Tuesday, June 9th. Um, and during this um, webinar today, together with Drs. Uh, Francois Pierre, Rebecca, and Carrie McKinney, and our patient partner, Gary Deakin, and two of our caregiver partners, Gary's wife, Shirley Deakin, and Gail Held Taylor, what we plan to do is revisit the, the insights that we shared during the first webinar on hospital to home transitions for older adults with complex health and social needs in light of the challenges created by the recent COVID-19 pandemic. And just to say that although COVID-19 has affected everyone, arguably older adults with complex health and social needs are, have been affected the most by this pandemic. And this has shed a light on previously acknowledged and as well as unacknowledged challenges that are facing this vulnerable population. And so today we're going to specifically focus on how the COVID-19 pandemic has specifically impacted hospital to home transition. And we really look forward to your input, to learning about your experiences on how COVID is changing the landscape of hospital to home transition. Next slide. The next slide. Um, so the citizen brief and the citizen panel uh, was that it was prepared to inform were funded through the Community Asset Supporting Transition Study, which receives funding from the Ontario Spore Support Unit, the Labarge Optimal Aging Initiative, and is supported by the CIHR Signature Initiative and community-based primary health care. The McMaster Health Forum receives both financial and in-kind support from McMaster University. The views expressed in the evidence brief and the views of the authors should not be taken to represent the views of the funder. Next slide. So first I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about our CAST study and our CAST intervention, Community Assets Supporting Transition. Our team developed an integrated nurse-led, patient-oriented transitional care program. And the overall goal of this program was to improve the quality and the experience of hospital to home transitions for older adults who have multiple chronic conditions, which we're defining as two or more chronic conditions, as well as had depressive symptoms. The intervention, as you can see on the slide, consisted of usual care plus a six month tailored patient centered intervention that was delivered by a registered nurse who functioned as a care transition coordinator within three study regions in Ontario. The intervention consisted of up to six home visits, telephone calls, as well as system navigation support provided by the, the care transition coordinator over a six month period. The, the care transition coordinator specifically conducted a comprehensive assessment of patient and caregivers' needs, their health and social care needs, using standardized tools, also was involved in identifying and managing depressive symptoms as well as their chronic conditions. They reviewed the, med the nurses reviewed the medications that people were taking, including supporting antidepressant medication management. Uh, they built patients' skills in problem solving and coping and provided education to participants and caregivers. So during and between the home visits, the care transitioner coordinators also provided system navigation that included identifying any risk factors that patients or caregivers might have with respect to hospital readmission or other adverse events. The other thing she did was to arrange for community services such as home care, as well as follow up with other primary care and other health care appointments. She facilitated communication between the patient, their family, and the healthcare team, and identified and supported linkages and referrals to relevant health and social service providers, and developed an individualized plan of care amongst all of the, the providers that were involved with that particular patient. So this study has been completed, and we're in the process of writing up the results, and hope to share the, more, the results more widely shortly. Next slide. So um, we did, a, as, as I mentioned in the earlier um, webinar, 
we conducted a citizen panel that was informed by a citizen brief. And during the citizen panel, the uh, panelists identified that they had many positive experience transitioning from hospital to home, but most agreed that hospital to home transitions were both stressful as well as risky. <clears throat> they generally felt um, that they were left to their own devices to manage their care and the care of their loved ones and to coordinate and navigate the healthcare system on their own. They identified a number of key areas that contributed to the stress and the risks associated with hospital to home transition, such as not having an identified community-based provider to coordinate their transition from hospital to home, or not having enough information about what to expect during the transition, both while in hospital and then while at home, and who to contact for help. Uh, they felt that they didn't have um, a, a comprehensive assessment prior to or immediately after that transition home, which could have identified patients and providers uh, about what was needed and where support was provided. And most importantly and finally is that many of the citizens felt that they were not in, had, a not, had an opportunity to be engaged in planning their hospital to home transition, which meant they had limited opportunity to digest information, to ask questions, or even to be given um, options. Next slide. So now thinking about COVID-19 and the pressures that are being placed on health systems, organizations, providers, patients, and caregivers, it's really important to look at this in light of some of the work we've done, which was done, um, the citizen panel was done during non-COVID times. So I think it's important to now look at how, how have things changed? Uh, are there other impacts that we need to consider? And so on. Next slide. So further research will certainly be needed to really understand the impact of the policies that have been enacted at different levels. So we've, we've all seen policies uh, related to COVID enacted at municipal levels, provincial, territorial, territorial and federal levels to flatten the curve such as social distancing. And we need to um, understand better what are the intended and unintended consequences, both short and long term, of, the, of these policies, and then to develop strategies to mitigate the negative consequences on older adults and their caregivers, specifically in relation to hospital to home transition. Research is also needed to document and understand the long term and the far-reaching effects of the pandemic, both positive and negative, on health as well as health equity that will continue beyond the, the pandemic. Next slide. So we have three main objectives for the webinar today. First of all, we're going to briefly review the top 10 insights on hospital to home transitions that were generated through our work on the citizen brief and the citizen panel that we shared at our first webinar on June the 9th. Secondly, we'll revisit these insights that were generated during non-COVID times in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So specifically, what has been the un unintended impact of COVID on hospital to home transitions for older adults with complex health and social needs and their caregivers? So focusing on those individuals who are not experiencing COVID and what are those unintended impacts on those non-COVID um, individuals. And then thirdly, to discuss the implications of these impacts on patients, caregivers, healthcare providers in the system as a whole. And we have a number of preliminary insights that we've developed as a team that we will share for further discussion and reflection. And just to note that these are really preliminary um, insights generated by our work and we look forward to your feedback on, on these insights and hearing more from you about what other um, insights exist and how COVID has impacted hospital to home transitions for this population. So now I'm going to turn it over to SP to do a review of the top 10 insights. Thank you, Maureen. And uh, if you do have any questions or comments during uh, the entire presentation, please do not hesitate to use uh, the chat box uh, that is at the lower uh, right-hand corner of your screen. So uh, we'll have uh, Stephen and myself keeping a close look at the chat box and uh, 
we'll try to use that uh, during the Q&A and the discussion periods to prompt discussion. So thank you. Uh, so as Maureen uh, mentioned, I'm just going to very briefly recap some of the top 10 in insights that we shared on our previous webinar on Tuesday. And these insights uh, were generated from our project. We had a, a citizen panel, so we brought together citizens from across um, Ontario. Uh, most of them were older adults with complex health and social needs or were uh, caregivers of older adults with complex health and social needs. So we wanted to get their views and insights on how can we improve hospital to home transitions. And uh, the first couple of insights, uh, first of all, this is the one that Maureen spoke earlier, so that despite some positive experience, generally speaking, hospital to home transitions were uh, perceived as stressful and risky. The second one is that uh, the hospital to home transition process seems to be fueled by many, many assumptions. So assumptions that uh, a plan will be uh, elaborated and also uh, implemented, that someone will be coordinating the implementation of the plan, that there will be enough support at home to take care of uh, the older adult, and so on. So throughout the planning, uh, the planning and also the implementation of those transitions, uh, there was a lot of assumptions. Inside number three uh, is the challenge of identifying and addressing both the care needs of older adults and caregivers, but also their decision, decisional needs. So we're, we can be pretty good at identifying the needs that they may have in terms of health care, but we don't necessarily have a clear picture of all the broader social care needs that uh, they may have. And also we don't necessarily know what are the key uh, and tough, tough, uh, tough uh, decisions that older adults and caregivers must face. So both the care needs and decisional needs are really difficult to identify and address. The fourth set of, uh, of insight is that there's a lot of skepticism towards large scale reforms to improve hospital to home transitions. So for those of you maybe from Ontario and are familiar with the ongoing health system reforms, we have those new Ontario health teams, uh, and, and the panelists were not necessarily familiar with these types of reforms. Uh, they were skeptical about the reorganization of the Ontario health system, and thus they, they wondered to what extent um, such large-scale reforms could actually really improve hospital to home transitions across the province. Another insight is that older adults and caregivers want access to information from comprehensive assessments. So they want those comprehensive assessments being done at the hospital be, before uh, being discharged and also back home to reassess the care needs and social needs of older adults. One thing that was mentioned also is that these comprehensive assessments should consider, uh, consider the illness trajectory, trajectories of older adults. Um, it came uh, particularly from one caregiver, uh, 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 his wife had dementia, and he was not really informed of what could be the illness trajectory of uh, uh, someone suffering from dementia. And this may have really influenced the planning process and the planning for the home and community care, care that they, they would need. A sixth insight is that older adults and caregivers want very concrete tools to hold providers accountable. So that could be to uh, evaluate their experience of hospital to home transitions, but also to monitor the implementation of a discharge plan and the plan to provide care uh, at home and in the community. So insight number seven from the citizen panel is that uh, citizens uh, really think we need to free up the time of providers so that they could engage in meaningful conversations with patients and caregivers, and also to conduct comprehensive assessments of care and decisional needs. So there was this impression that given the shortage of providers, uh, uh, there was no time for them to actually make comprehensive assessment and engage them in uh, a shared decision-making process about hospital to home transitions. 
Insight number eight is that there's a need to support providers to, uh, in order to provide proactively both in-reach and also outreach services, as opposed to responding reactively when a health problem happens. So by in-reach services, they refer to uh, uh, health and preventive interventions that could, could be provided to any type of older adults who are touching the system, who are having appoint, appointments with their primary care providers and so on. But also outreach services for those uh, who may not necessarily seek care, those that uh, may be more socially isolated, more vulnerable, and are difficult to uh, usually uh, reach. So we need to find ways to actively, proactively uh, connect with uh, these older adults and caregivers. And the last two insights from the citizen panel, the first one, the uh, insight number one, uh, nine, was the need to enable decision makers at all levels with a solid strategy to scale up an innovative hospital to home transition model. So they said that uh, probably uh, some regions uh, may not have the capacity to implement and scale up these types of transitional models. So perhaps we need to have some centralized uh, organization that could provide support, that could strengthen capacity across the province and also the capacity to adapt the model to the different regions. And lastly, uh, really patients, families and caregivers, they really want to play an active role and facilitate or trigger a system-wide collaboration. So they see themselves not just as uh, passive actors in all this, but they really see that they can uh, uh, really facilitate collaboration across all the different stakeholders who could improve um, hospital to home transitions, both in the health system and the social systems. So these were the insights from our citizen panel. Um, if you're interested and you, you missed the first webinar on Tuesday, these were uh, posted. Uh, the webinar is now posted and available. Uh, you can access the recording uh, on the McMaster Forum website or on YouTube. So uh, we'll make sure that uh, you get access to the link uh, after the webinar. So we had all these great insights. Uh, we were planning to do a stakeholder dialogue to further um, uh, this project with various stakeholders and also including patients and uh, caregivers. And then came the pandemic and it kind of changed our game plan. It changed many, many things in our life. Uh, and so we had to kind of revisit, take a step back and revisit the findings in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and also think about how this pandemic is changing the landscape of hospital to home transitions. So as Maureen mentioned, today we're gonna to try to provide some of the uh, insights from, the, from our group, and we'd like to see uh, whether these insights resonate and if perhaps you have additional insights that you'd like to share with the group. So jumping in, uh, on insight number one in the context of the COVID-19 pandemics, from a system level perspective, it was interesting to see the variety uh, of decisions that have been made across the health and social system uh, to try to respond to the pandemic. And these decisions may have potentially affected for better or worse hospital to home transitions. So of course, we're pretty familiar with decisions related, related to public health measures. So a lot of infection prevention, and cultural measures like confinement, physical and social distancing, and also some specific measures targeting um, seniors and uh, seniors residents. For instance, uh, older adults who are discharged from hospital and going back to their seniors resident must self isolate within their room for 14 days. So these types of public health measures uh, may have greatly affected hospital to home transitions uh, and care seeking behaviors. Another thing that changed uh, in types of decisions that may have affected hospital to home transitions are all the changes due to clinical management of COVID-19 and related health issues. And we've seen uh, examples of uh, many people being un unable to, uh, un to manage properly their chronic conditions 
where we've seen uh, new and exacerbated mental health issues, a lot of fear around COVID-19 that may have contributed to delayed care seeking. So people being afraid to go into their primary care physicians or perhaps going to the hospital to obtain needed care uh, in fear of being infected by COVID-19. There's been also uh, health system arrangements, uh, decisions that have been made, and um, we've closed some routine care services, uh, we've closed some ambulatory clinics, and now we're in the process of restarting ambulatory clinics, cancer treatments, and elective procedures. Uh, we've made a lot of changes and a shift towards virtual care, so now we're in the stage where we're trying to see um, how can we maintain uh, virtual care, how can we build on the gains um, achieved with virtual care in the past couple of months. But also beyond the health system, beyond healthcare, there's also been an economic and social response to COVID-19 uh, that may have in in impact, uh, in uh, impacted older adults and caregivers and may have impacted hospital to home transition. So uh, a lot of decisions related to financial protections of older adults, to food security and access to basic, uh, basic goods, housing, decisions related to recreation and transportation that may affect the transitions. So that's our first insight uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. The second one, which is more, uh, again, at a societal level, we've seen with the COVID-19 uh, response and the COVID-19 pandemic, that it may have fueled uh, ageism. So we know that ageism uh, is pr still um, predominant in our societies. But again, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've seen in public discourses, in social media, um, a strong trend towards ageism and also towards uh, that may have generated some intergenerational divisions. And we see often older adults uh, portrayed as vulnerable, frail, helpless, and unable, unable to contribute to society. Uh, so uh, this is something that's quite important to consider uh, because it does have an impact uh, on care-seeking behaviors, on uh, social cohesion and social isolation of, of, of older adults and caregivers. Um, it may also lead people to hide that they are infected by COVID-19 to avoid being discriminated, discriminated against. It can also prevent them from seeking care when in need or perhaps discourage them from adopting healthy behavior. So this ageism, I think this is something that we need to be considering when we talk about hospital to home transition in the COVID-19 era. So that was Insight number two, and then I'll pass the microphone to uh, Rebecca. We'll share a uh, next series of uh, insights from the project. Rebecca? Great. Thank, thanks so much, FP. Uh, so insight number three is with respect to reduced lengths of stay. So what we know is that efforts to adopt to the COVID landscape or adapt and also to maintain system capacity, so thinking about maintaining bad availability for uh, the COVID response, we know that that has implications and may result in, in reduced length of stay for non-COVID patients. And thinking about that, it may, you know, those shortened uh, hospital stays may, li may limit access to inpatient rehabilitation services, for example. It also abbreviates the discharge planning period. There's less time to organize a cohesive plan around discharge planning. The other uh, implication is really in terms of the patient. The person going home may have greater care needs, and yet there may be lower system capacity to be able to address those needs. And we already know that there were issues of imbalance uh, around uh, the needs that people have and the ability of the system to align with those needs at the level that's needed. Uh, so if we could go to insight number four, please. Uh, so the other piece of that, and I just talked uh, briefly about this, is really limiting capacity to engage in discharge planning. So we know that system resources are stretched. We know uh, from our, our study and also from the previous uh, citizen panel that there were existing concerns around how engaged family members were in discharge planning. 
and and thinking about the COVID response, when people when you know caregivers are unable to visit in hospital, this adds layers or challenges to that engagement process. So it further limits those opportunities to digest information and make informed decisions, as Maureen briefly talked about earlier, uh, and as raised by the panelists pre-COVID. This was in the pre-COVID landscape. People were already saying they had limited opportunities to do that. Uh, this, you know, the layering of the shortened stays and the and you know sort of system reallocation in the COVID response means that it's really challenging to do that kind of comprehensive communication about what to expect and when and who to contact if the process doesn't go as planned. This is what we heard from our panelists that that becomes even more challenging and less likely to happen. So you know, lots of challenges that are faced that are limiting that capacity for meaningful patient and family-centered discharge planning tailored to needs where there's an assessment not only of health needs, of mental health concerns or, or existing issues, but also understanding what that social uh, landscape looks for them. And also, and furthermore, if caregivers live outside of the home, there have been challenges thinking about the messaging around only uh, being in contact with people in your own household. And so the ability to engage that broader network of social supports uh, becomes really challenging. Next slide, please. The other issue is, is that there's reduced access to primary care and other community-based services during this period. So the pandemic resulted in the cancellation or suspension of routine and ongoing care for many people, and, and that ex uh, exacerbated existing access issues amongst disadvantaged populations. So in terms of system capacity and management, the ability to have an, a patient and family-centered uh, care model becomes really challenging. Uh, you know, as FP already talked about, many people didn't seek care because they were afraid of contracting COVID, or they didn't know what was available and how services were being delivered. They, you know, may have heard about offering virtual care. They didn't know if it was being offered in their area or by their, you know, their primary care provider. And they were worried that if they had to go into their primary care provider's office, that they might contract uh, COVID in that context. So it has really, COVID-19 has exacerbated some of these existing issues around communication and the ability to engage people in decision making. And the COVID response itself is system driven. I mean, all of these um, issues that have been identified were really um, system driven rather than having that patient and family centered lens. It's really about reorganizing the health system to meet the increased demands related to this infectious disease response. And I'll turn it over to Carrie next, I believe. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so one of the other things that we've seen happen with COVID-19 is that uh, some of the care has shifted to uh, being provided in a virtual way. And, you know, this has had many advantages, I think, um, in that if people are uh, able to get access to some of the care that they require, but it also uh, may pose some challenges. Um, of course, when we're talking about virtual care or virtual anything, um, you know, we know that some people do have issues in terms of reliable internet access and also the uh, affordability of technology. Um, and then there's also potentially knowledge gaps. So learning how to um, utilize the different platforms that healthcare providers might be using, um, what, how exactly to work with a provider over an online platform. You know, we've all been accustomed to, you know, going into our family doctor's office and we sort of know what to expect. You know, we register, we sit in the waiting room, we go into the examination room. But, but how does that exactly work when we're uh, in a virtual environment? So there's a bit of a learning curve that would be required. And then um, there's also a challenge when it comes to individuals who are living in retirement homes. Uh, because most retirement homes have had uh, visitor restriction policies put in place, as was described. And um, as a result, their family members may then, uh, whatever caregiving roles they might have been providing to that individual um, living in the retirement home, they now have to try and carry these out um, at a distance, uh, which again can be quite challenging um, to, for the individual themselves and for the family. Next slide, please. So the seventh insight has to do with exacerbating mental health issues. 
So when it comes to transitions uh, from hospital to home, we, we already know that, that transitions can put people at risk for mental health issues. Um, if there's an existing uh, mental health concern, that can be uh, exacerbated when somebody is transitioning from hospital to home, or even time spent in the hospital can be a risk factor for mental health issues. When you then layer on top um, the situation with COVID-19, um, perhaps the fear and anxiety associated with that, but then also the fact that people are, have a number of restrictions on them, uh, this can really contribute to worsening some of the mental health issues that people might be facing, including depression, anxiety, and as well as substance uh, use. So you know, these are things that we will need to be considering and really trying to understand as we go through this pandemic process. Um, when it comes to um, many mental health services, there may be changes there as well. So in some cases, there may have been cancellations um, or reductions in those services. And, and in other cases, there's a move to um, the online delivery. And as I just said, talked about, that can be advantageous in some ways, but it also can have some uh, negative impacts or the potential for negative impacts. So again, we will really need to, to look at things uh, once we are, are and as we are going through this period uh, to understand you know, what might be needed in the future and what are the potential impacts that, that this has really had on, in many ways on older adults um, and their caregivers in terms of transitional care. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, in a related way, um, you know, one of the other um, restrictions that has been put in place has had to do with, you know, the encouragement of people to stay home and not to be out. Many closures other than uh, essential services. So it's really resulted in that restriction of mobility. And so, you know, you can imagine that um, individuals that have been discharged or transferred from, uh, transitioned from hospital to home, you know, they um, will likely have follow-up activities that they should be um, engaging in. Um, but then, so what happens when they have these restrictions in place at the same time? So it, uh, it may make it challenging to access some of those services and supports, which may have negative impacts on their, their physical and mental health conditions. Um, and then, of course, there is the impact on the social support that they might feel. Um, because they're they're not able to to see individuals and and depending if they're living alone or not, they may be um, you know challenged to get some of the support that they would normally have received um, sort of uh, pre-COVID. So now I will turn it over to Gail. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I've been a full-time caregiver in our home for the past five years until my husband passed away last August. So today, I'm going to discuss the challenges of COVID-19 from a hypothetical point of view by imagining how caregiving might have been for me during this pandemic. One of the first challenges would be to keep our home safe during the pandemic. My first priority would be to limit the number of people coming into our home in order to mitigate the, the spread of the virus. But in our case, uh, John required personal care providers or care workers during his decline. So, and, then, and they worked in several locations, including two long-term care facilities. So today, this would increase the risk incredibly for exposure for, to, for, for our family for, to the virus. Therefore, the use of masks and other protective equipment would be a concern, especially for care providers. Would they be required to wear protective gowns? <clears throat> and would their masks be reliable? Would they have to meet certain particular standards? And what about family masks? Would cloth masks be sufficient? And in our case, our family case, would a mask interfere with John's respiratory condition? And then there's the issue of social distancing. It certainly would be possible for the care provider and me to maintain the six-foot distance between us. But how in the world could the care provider distance herself from John 
when she bathes him, dresses him, shaves him with an electric shaver. It'd be absolutely impossible for her to maintain a safe distance from John, therefore increasing the risk of infecting him. And then, then after the care worker leaves, there is the need to disinfect everything that the care worker might have touched. The raised toilet seat, the shower head, the counters, the taps, light switches, doorknobs, John's walker or perhaps wheelchair if that's what he was, had been using, as well as all the hardware on the main entrance door inside and out. The list goes on. In addition, we'd also have to maintain vigilance in keeping our hands clean at all times <clears throat> with soap and water or hand sanitizers, hand, hand sanitizers or disinfecting wipes. <laughs> Presently, they're very difficult to find. New slide. A second major challenge for caregivers uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is the risk of burnout for caregivers. First, there'd be an ongoing fear that they might contract the virus, causing a great deal of stress and anxiety. And in addition, the caregiver will feel isolated because family members or neighbors can no longer come to, vi come to the home to, to assist, and that was mentioned earlier. To compound the problem, there is presently a reduction of system support, such as meal programs that have been canceled. So in our case, the pureed meals that John requires would be unavailable. Also, care provider support is reduced because of the epidemic. For example, in our case, last year, one of our, our the, the, the person who was our, our caregiver, our care worker at the time that we had last year, she had to give up her job this year in order to stay home with her son because of COVID-19. In this case, the caregiver would be required to take on greater responsibilities to care for the loved one. Also contributing to burnout is the reduction of opportunities for caregivers to get a break or a respite from the endless caregiving responsibilities. System respite opportunities are no longer available. That's where, <clears throat> where I was very fortunate to have, where a caregiver, a care provider would stay with, with John uh, so that I could go out to meet with a friend or have coffee or even lunch. Of course, that's impossible now. And so that support is certainly non-existent now. In addition, special programs are now cancelled for those, for example, who have, might have al Alzheimer's disease, and they would, which would have given the caregivers a break. So finally, caregivers living with COVID-19 environment of today are at high risk for mental and physical burnout because they live in a, in a constant fear of contracting the virus. They face a reduction of services with increased workload no respite care, no support from family or friends, adding to their feelings of stress, anxiety, and certainly isolation. So it's no wonder that caregivers may face mental burnout. As I stated earlier, I'm no longer a full-time caregiver this year. So my heart goes out to all those caregivers during, presently during the pandemic. I can't imagine how you are managing as you face the reality of today. I wish you well. Thank you so much, Gail, uh, for your great insights uh, and your extensive uh, caregiving experience. Uh, so we'll now turn to uh, Shirley and Gary Dakin. And Shirley and Gary uh, recently had um, the experience of uh, having to transition from hospital to home during the pandemic. So Shirley and Gary could uh, provide us some of their insights into this experience what were particularly challenging um, in this uh, specific context. Uh, so uh, Shirley and Gary, are you able to uh, use your microphone? I will just... Stephen, I think they are, are you able to unmute them? Oh, perfect, I see it seems to be working. Shirley and Gary, can you hear Hi. me? Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. I uh, so... We were actually very fortunate in the fact that Gary was discharged um, from the uh, rehab facility in Hamilton on February 25th, which was, you know, two to three weeks before everything really started to shut down. And uh, so, you know, he was at, was able to uh, have a 
have a few visits at the rehab uh, outpatient and got to know his uh, support team there, his occupational therapist and his physiotherapist. Um, in the hospital, um, we had a very positive experience. Uh, the, uh, the staff, the social workers, the therapists, actually all worked really well with, with Gary. Um, to the transition to, be, to go home, we had a few short visits as trials. And then when it came time for him to actually come home, they were right there and got us in touch with the Lynn. And, you know, we had occupational therapists and physiotherapists checking on us before we came home and after. So we were actually very lucky on that front. Um, when the uh, therapies went virtual, or even actually about a week before they went virtual, we did get a little nervous uh, about going to uh, his uh, physiotherapy sessions, and we actually didn't go the, the one week right before they did shut down, just, you know, as was stated, for fear of getting a virus. And and that not so much for and you know Gary had had a stroke and he had he has his health issues, but the biggest concern was not because cause it didn't really make him more susceptible um, be, with his issues, but if I got sick because of the pandemic, you know, with the restrictions placed on family being allowed to come in, then who would look after him? And that was our our biggest concern, and and you know, and is still somewhat of a concern still. You know, as I sort of resumes back to normal or whatever the new normal is going to be, um, you know, we're we're still very cautious when we go out. Um, you know, no one has been in our house except for our one son who chose to live with us. Uh, what? when everything went awry uh, because he's single and, you know, nobody wants to be sitting in an apartment by themselves. So we were fortunate enough to, ha to have him be here, but, you know, you still don't want to take advantage of that. But even when they, they shut down the rehab center, uh, we were very lucky that both his, his physiotherapist and his occupational therapist were in contact by phone, steady with us, to phone and email, uh, checking up on him, and uh, then advised us that there was going to be virtual care taking uh, being set up. And uh, like I said, they they've been in contact and still remain in in contact with us. So we've been very fortunate that so you know i understand the study but it's i feel like gary was kind of blessed to be before the transition you know like do you understand what i'm saying yes absolutely perfect yeah and, and the experience with the virtual care, you, you mentioned that there was some concerns, but overall, what was your assessment with the, the switch to virtual re rehabilitation? Did you want to speak to that? Um, it was good. Um, they got their point across. I'm, um, I'm lucky that Shirley is a, a personal trainer, so she understood what, we're, what had to be done. And we have a gym downstairs, so we've been working down there. And uh, so it's worked out very well for us. I could understand that maybe some others would not do so well. Um, you know, I, I think at times there's nothing like a hands-on approach, especially with physiotherapy. And uh, I might be a trainer, but I'm not a physiotherapist. So, you know, my, I'm not going to pretend that my knowledge base goes any further than it does. Uh, so 
you know, we, when you have a half hour session with two specialists trying to teach you as much as they can, and you need to try and absorb as much as you can. Um, I mean, you do the, you, you do your best. It's not their their fault. I mean, they've been amazing. I'm not. I, I wouldn't say they were. They haven't been. But the, I think the lack of the hands on has been the biggest drawback of the of the virtual. Perfect. Thanks, Charlie and Gary. Excellent. And I'm sure the audience will probably have questions for you <laughs> in in just a minute. So thanks for sharing this experience and. Um, so, thank you so much. And uh, I, so, I'd like to turn to, to the audience. And if you do have comments, if you'd like to share your own in, insights, for instance, is there any insights that we have shared so far that resonated with you, uh, particularly? Um, do you have a, any specific COVID 19 experience that you'd like to share, both at the hospital or back home, that have uh, positively or neg negatively affected the? Uh, hospital to home transitions, any other challenges that you uh, have experienced. So this is a time to share your comments and insights and perhaps ask uh, questions to our panelists. So just as a reminder, you can use the chat box, which is on the lower right-hand corner uh, of your screen to uh, ask your questions and comments. So uh, Stephen, do we have already comments and questions? I see a few perhaps in the chat box right now. Yeah, Stephen? Yeah, sorry, I was just uh, had to get back to the mute button. We had a few earlier uh, that were just kind of questions as uh, as you're going through, as everybody was kind of going through their presentations. They may have already been covered, but uh, one was about um, how the nurse and the cast study connected with the PMH. Um, so I'm not sure if that was, I don't remember who was uh, speaking to that, but. Uh, that would be Maureen probably with the cast, correct? Sorry, can you repeat that? I, I missed the last part of that question. Sure, it was a question about how the nurse or how the host nurse and the cast connected with the PMH. Primary. I don't know, it just says PMH, so. Oh, okay. Uh, Sorry. I I'm not well, sure maybe, what PMH is. Yeah. Maybe it's Carrie. Maybe I'll jump in. I don't know what PMH is. Oh, wait. Patient's medical home. I see it in the chat box. Medical home. So the family doctor, I assume. Oh, okay. I can I can take a stab at that. So the, uh, the nurse, one of the first things that the nurse did was to establish um, who was in that patient, what we call circle of care, or, or who was involved in caring for the patient which included their family doctor. And so we sent a letter to the family physician right away to let them know that um, the patient was in the study. And then the nurse communicated with the physician regularly about her assessment and the findings from her assessment. And we had specific um, forms that she used to alert the physician to concerns specifically around um, concerns around medications or concerns around depressive symptoms and requesting that the, uh, the patient, um, contact, either the patient contact the physician or the physician contact the patient for further assessment and follow up, especially in relation to depressive symptoms if it required, for example, starting someone on an antidepressant. So there was regular communication between the nurse and the family physician. Perfect, thank you, Maureen. Yeah. Uh, I, I see another comments or questions regarding uh, the study itself and whether the uh, the findings would be uh, published soon. So uh, if the question was about the citizen panel, so we have the products that are now published and publicly available via the McMaster Forum website, but perhaps this refers to the CAS study. So uh, Maureen, Rebecca, uh, and Carrie, will this, uh, will the, find, uh, the findings from the study will be published soon? So we have a um, preliminary um draft of the findings on our website, the Aging Canadian Health Research Unit, um, and we are we have just uh, are in the process of submitting a paper for publication of the results, and our plan is to conduct a webinar in the future 
um, that uh, will provide you provide a high level summary of the, of the findings. Perfect. So that can be found, I guess, in the webinar will probably be announced through the achru.mcmaster.ca website. So if you'd like to uh, find additional information and uh, the preliminary draft uh, of uh, the report, uh, it, you can find it there. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Uh, Stephen, anything on your side? I haven't seen any other questions come through, but I would certainly encourage anybody that has any additional questions to ask them in the chat box. Uh, the only other comments, uh, comments slash questions that I've seen come through have been about whether uh, whether there will be this web uh, this webinar will be made available afterwards. So uh, the webinar from Tuesday, as well as this one, the recordings of both these webinars will be made available on the McMaster Health Forum website under our top ten webinars page. So if you missed the one from Tuesday or you just want to get a recap or you want to share it with somebody else, uh, they'll certainly be available there. Perfect. Thanks, Stephen. And I know in terms of next step for us, uh, we're hoping to host our stakeholder dialogue in the fall, so uh, in the next few months. Um, certainly, it's going to be focusing on hospital-to-home transitions for older adults with complex health and social needs. And certainly, we'll be talking about the big elephant in the room, COVID-19. Uh, so uh, this uh, stakeholder dialogue will have a few products that will be made uh, publicly available, including a full report uh, report called an evidence brief, as well as uh, a, a dialogue summary where you'll see um, the insights from various stakeholders um, interested in hospital to home transitions. And we're also going to plan some interviews with uh, some of the stakeholder dialogue participants who will be able to share their uh, uh, insights from the dialogue. So this will be made available via uh, YouTube and also via the McMaster Forum website. So um, these are some of the next steps for us. If we don't have comments, perhaps I could turn to uh, my colleagues, uh, Maureen, Rebecca, Carrie, Gail, and our friends uh, Shirley and Gary, if they have perhaps uh, one final comment. Perhaps Maureen? Sure. So um, I'd just be interested in know. I'm just looking at there is a, a comment that just came up in the chat room. Uh, do the panelists feel that system, systemic ageism regarding dignity of the elderly may contribute to inadequate discharge planning? I think that. Um, FP covered that very well, um, and um, certainly I think that it could have a negative impact on discharge planning, and certainly it's um, a multifaceted problem that has multiple layers that um, have been exacerbated by uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. So maybe FP, you could respond to that. that that's correct. So it did came, uh, uh, not necessarily as explicitly as it uh, emerge in other panels that we did, but uh, certainly ageism has been kind of a, a common thread in most of the citizen panels we hosted in the past five years, whether uh, we're talking about palliative care, end-of-life care, uh, and so on. Uh, ageism often comes up as a, a source of concern uh, among uh, our participants, so certainly it, it, it's always in the back of people's mind and how uh, ageism can potentially affect the care they receive and um, how they may potentially seek care uh, in need. FP, it's Carrie. Could I jump in too? Yes, absolutely. Sure. So, you know, I, I, I think that, that this is a really important question and something that we really need to look at um, because, you know, we, we've seen and heard of circumstances where um, the, the, the desire, and we might call that a push, uh, to get people out of hospital, um, it happens sometimes so quickly with um, a lack of, of planning, a lack of information, um, and and a lack of a, a, a plan and resources. So you know, people have been sometimes just sent home without the supports that they need. Perhaps even sent by taxi home, where there's perhaps no food in the fridge and so on. Um, and you know, I, I think if we compare that with 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 children and what happens when a baby is born, and the supports that are uh, made available, 
Like you would never have uh, someone, a baby, a child, leave the hospital without, for example, a car seat. Uh, just that's not allowed. Um, so there's there's certain things that are you know a must must do's for children or people of other ages, and we don't see that for older adults. So I think that there you know could very well be some systematic ageism that's happening. And it's Rebecca, I would just add to that because I was thinking some similar things, Carrie, is just really going back to what we've heard around the discharge planning process being fueled by assumptions, the assumption that there is a caregiver in place, the assumption that there's food in the fridge, the assumption that that someone's able to leave their home and act and go to the pharmacy and get the medications that they need if they're, you know, sent home with a, you know, with perhaps multiple medications that they need to, or prescriptions that they need to fill. There are all these assumptions that the person can manage for the 24 to 48 or however long, you know, whatever number of hours before uh, home care services come in if they're eligible for services, depending on what the level of support is. So uh, really looking at what does that home environment look like and how feasible is it for someone to actually manage their own care with whatever level of support that's available. Thanks, Rebecca. I see two comments in the chat box. Um, with the first comment saying excellent work uh, and a question, to what extent will you be making recommendations uh, to bolster and better integrate the roles of registered nurses in primary care and other community-based models, uh, the connection between healthcare and community support services as well? Any comments on the role uh, of uh, integrating registered nurse in a better way? Yeah, I, I can just start with that one. So that this role that we created was, um, was a role that didn't previously exist in the system. And so um, our work was really looking at what is the um, feasibility of implementing this role in the community and what were some of the barriers and facilitators to that. And then what was the effectiveness of having this uh, care transition nurse um, in terms of hospital readmissions and so on. And so um, we expect that um, the results can be used in the future to um, support the integration of nurses in this capacity. And one area in which we found uh, the nurse was very effective was in helping to integrate um, health and social services through her role as a care coordinator or care transition coordinator because oftentimes people go home from hospital and they, and especially people with multiple chronic conditions who are seeing multiple providers, but those providers are not talking to each other and there's no one really coordinating that care. Um, and so that was a really important role of the nurse is to facilitate that communication and to develop a plan of care that everyone was um, part of and uh, could contribute to. And to also help people to understand what sort of resources are available in the community and to link to those resources. So certainly there is a, a, a definite uh, opportunity to uh, look at potentially scaling up this model and looking at integrating the nurse into an existing system like primary care or a community-based program. Thank you, Maureen. And I see one last question. In your opinion, what could be an interesting option for a concrete tool um, as seniors want them uh, to hold providers accountable and that could be used in the post-COVID era? So in terms of concrete tools. So there was a discussion about that in the citizen panel and actually some of the panelists actually created their own tool, uh, some of their own checklist and everybody wanted to have access to uh, the, that specific tool. But uh, there was also a discussion about some evaluation metrics that could be um, used to provide, uh, to hold providers accountable. But uh, Maureen, Rebecca, uh, Gail, Kerry, any thoughts on concrete tools that could be used? So it's Kerry. Um, I, I can at least start off. Um, you know, I don't know that, it, I think that there's different tools that might be out there, um, but, um, I, uh, you know, they're probably not very widely available. Um, I think if we're looking at some type of concrete tool, what's going to be really important is to um, find something or develop something with the input and insights of uh, older adults themselves and also family caregivers. 
because they're the ones that are really going to know, you know, what that experience is like and what are the needs that they have. And so what, what the specific um, factors or elements are that would need to be included in those tools in order to enable or, or um, you know, ensure that there's some accountability there. So I don't know if we have specific existing tools at this point, um, but, you know, I think we would just need that input to either review existing tools or to develop one um, that would be most useful. And uh, yep. just to add to that, I was just going to say uh, the other important piece um, is that once we have identified those tools that are relevant to patients and caregivers, that they be implemented um, widely and that they be used to inform um, ongoing changes in the system. So that information would be collected, analyzed, and then used to improve um, patient experience and the delivery of, of uh, care um, post-discharge and pre-discharge. Perfect. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Carrie. So I think this uh, comes to the end of our webinar for today. I'd like to thank everyone on the panel, and I want to thank the audience. And certainly a special thanks to uh, Shirley and Gary Dakin for joining us today. So thank you, Shirley and Gary, for sharing your experience. Um, and we you wish you uh, all the best in, in the recovery process. So thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, uh, thank you to Stephen for hosting uh, the webinar. So uh, Stephen, any final words on your side? Uh, no, just a reminder that if you are interested in a recording from either this webinar or the one we hosted on Tuesday, that they will be made available on the McMaster Health Forum site under our top 10 webinar page. Thank you very much. So everyone, have a great day. It was a pleasure to connect with you today. You too. Thank you very much for including us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye.